And I'm sure. just going to read the very bottom of this page to start. Gandhi inquired what Baba meant by concentrating and putting the power of his mind in it. They were talking about uh, a game of chess. The master then gave the following explanation. <clears throat> he who is a slave to his mind is an ordinary human being. He who has conquered the mind, but at the same time is overpowered by it, drowned in intoxication, is called by Sufis a majub. A wali or a saint who has progressed toward the goal lives in the higher spiritual planes and controls the mind to some extent. <clears throat> the first case, slave to the mind, is of the worldly mind, and the second is of God, meaning the majub has a state of mind that has realized the truth. The wali or saint is in advanced stages of the mind and mental control, progressing toward realization of the truth. But the perfect master, or Kutub, or Salik, is quite a different state, wherein he can enjoy and experience every condition of the mind whenever he wishes. And the footnote says, Salik is an Arabic word meaning pilgrim, traveler, or devotee, one who desires closeness with God, and at the same time is also aware of the needs of life. The word is derived from Salat, meaning favored by God. <clears throat> For example, a perfect master is rarely required to put his mind into worldly affairs, but occasionally he has to do so for the sake of his circle members. For instance, the residents of Kamatpura, lane number seven, are King George's subjects. But does his majesty know anything about Kamat Kamatpura, a Bombay slum? Whether such a place exists at all in his empire, far short of the individual residents of the locality, if, however, he wishes to know anything about Kamatapura or even one particular resident of the place, he can be furnished with the necessary information in no time, either through the telegraph office, the post office, or the CID, Secret Service. <clears throat> Similarly, a perfect master can reach to the very source of anything and everything that he cares to know about. That is, concentrate his mind and put the power of his mind in it. But he seldom does it. The interest he seems to take in the things of this world, by word or deed, is simply offhanded, however serious his interest may appear outwardly. On such rare occasions, the mind that he, the perfect master, seems to use is the mind devoid of divinity. He simply does things as they occur to him at the time, almost mechanically, without thinking about it. Through discourses, and also by reciting poems, the master would shed light on spiritual matters for the Mandali. The following guzzle was written by Baba during the early 1920s, translated many years later by Adi Sr. This world exists, but it is not your final abode. Turn your face toward God. How long will you live in this transient world? It is a testing ground of virtue and vice for you to experience. Slacken not your effort in worshiping God. Look upon every breath as your last. You know not what will happen tomorrow. So be prepared today for the future. Conditions in the world have not changed, but marvelous has been the visitors to this world. From the garden of this world have departed millions of nightingales, beings. Hundreds of thousands more will come and go. Atma, the soul, is one. Varied are the bodies indeed. Like the many sons of one father cherished. Behold there on the meadow of love, many a rider of variegated colors flourishes. With our adversity, there is no rest. In hardship and sorrow, be grateful and at peace. In distress, always keep content. Have patience and at all times be at ease. Continuously washing your clothes is a waste of time. Instead, purify your heart with the thought of God divine. Behold at the feet of one God in form, every moment hundreds of souls lie in sacrifice. Do not take forbidden intoxicants. Better to live a life of honor and esteem. Learn to live in the unique intoxication of the early morning love of God. God is matchless one in all. See him in your heart. See him also 
as the God manifest, the God concealed, the God within you, and the God without. O oh man, in your boast, you lost the status of an angel. Pride has reduced you to a devil. O oh Huma, in this world of passing show, behold, like you, innumerable players come and go. Once a stranger came to Manzel, Manzel Imim and narrated his long list of problems to Baba. He begged Baba to bless him and bow to the master. After he had gone, Baba remarked, people coming to see me always ask me to bless them. These simple souls do not know that masters really neither bless nor curse anyone. The fulfillment of their worldly desires gained by approaching a divine personality is in direct proportion to the faith they manifest toward him and their prayers are answered by the divine powers active around him. A perfect master works in the spiritual domain. Those on the plains can be said to bless for it is their spoken word that brings about the desired result. When approaching a perfect master with the object of deriving material benefit, one would be better off requesting him for his curse because a blessing from him, if at all he gives it, is likely to uproot one's sanskaric links from his worldly surroundings with a view to making him one like the master. All right, uh, would somebody else want to pick up from here? I can read. Kodadad Kehrani's family owned a textile mill in Ahmedabad. He was the son of Gulmai's cousin and had heard about Meher Baba from Gulmai. Kodadad was permitted to stay in Manzili Mim. And during the day, he was employed in the textile mill. Kodadad had suffered from chronic asthma since childhood, so Baba nicknamed him Asthma. Despite the best medical treatment and dietary precautions, Kodadad could not rid himself of his ailment. But it was observed that since coming to the Manzil and being addressed by this new nickname, he was freed from any asthma attacks and the disease eventually left him altogether. It seemed almost miraculous that his attacks did not recur in spite of taking cold baths each morning like the other residents. On 4th October, Asma purchased a new bicycle and brought it to the Manzo so that Baba would be the first to ride it. Baba, oh, gee. <laughs> on 4th October, Asma purchased a new bicycle and brought it to the Manzo so that Baba would be the first to ride it. Baba agreed and rode it over the recently rolled back playground. Thereafter, instructing Asma never to lend the bicycle to anyone else to use. Later that evening, after dinner, the master expounded on the function of the Sadguru, explaining more about yoga, samskaras, and mukti, liberation. No yogi can gain eternal freedom or emancipation, even though he might have reached the highest yogic state of samadhi through his practices, because sanskaras are still there and all ties have not yet been snapped. Sanskaras mean the impressions in the mind left behind while doing any good or bad action. Even a thought creates sanskaras. Talking, listening, thinking, seeing, eating, sleeping. In fact, even subtle motions 
produce many more sanskaras, which have to be experienced with mechanical precision, unless removed or nullified by a master's grace. Our present life with all its experiences of pain and pleasure, virtue and vice is the result of our past sanskaras. The very breath we breathe, the blinking of our eyelids, the finger we lift are all due to past impressions. It is the mere unfoldment of our past subtle impressions reflected in our present life. And our present life goes on creating more sanskaras. A good word or action has its beneficial result compressed in an impression. Imagine it in the form of a circle and a bad word or action likewise stores up a bad result in a similar subtle form. Thus, good deeds of this life assure a happy future life and bad actions in the present life result in a miserable future birth. This bondage of actions is the tie that is deep rooted and cannot be easily uprooted and gotten rid of. Good actions bind a man with a golden chain and bad actions with an iron spiked one. But the chain is there in either case and the man is never set free. Yoga and other practices are good and merit an aspirant a good life in the next birth. But a man is never free from bondage or given mukti as a result of them. Therefore, to achieve emancipation, one must be without virtues or sins, without any kind of sanskaras. One's slate should be quite clean without credit or debit in one's account. And this is impossible without the grace of the guru. But for the sad guru, it is the work of a fraction of a second. The vast, nearly infinite number of impressions in a person's mind are like straws in a haystack, which are impossible for the person to wipe out on his own. Even the process of cleaning them away through yogic practices without the help of a perfect master means contracting some kind of sanskaric impressions again in a different form. To realize God, the sanskaras have to be removed. Only a matchstick is needed to set the haystack on fire. It is a moment's work, but only a Sadhguru has that match. He uses it for his circle members and thereby, in even less than a second, brings them to his own divine level of realization. Even those persons who have no direct connection with the Sadhguru from past lives can derive the greatest possible benefit merely through his physical contact and company. Early in the morning on Thursday, 5th October, 1922, Baba told the men he had not slept at night due to a noise in the backyard. It was as if someone were leveling the ground with a heavy roller, he said. Then he explained that it was a ghost. 
this spirit is always with me wherever I go. He is one of the ghosts whom Arjun saw outside the hut at Pune. Upasni Maharaj has put him in my charge. Some of you may see this spirit. If it happens, don't be afraid of him. And don't be afraid to move about in the monsoon during the day or at night. Once while Ghani was massaging Baba's legs at night, Baba further explained about ghost and why he had his body rubbed. The physical contact of a human being with my body keeps the spirit world away from me for the time being and thereby enables me to snatch a little rest. My sleep is not the sleep of ordinary human beings. It is a sort of mental rest from my spiritual working. A spirit always accompanies me wherever I go and is with me whatever I do. All right, thank you, Rosalie. Uh, Mona, would you like to pick up here? Sure. During some nights in his room upstairs, Baba was heard uttering. They are beating and torturing me. Most likely, this was not in reference to ghosts, but to his previous statements, which he had not explained, that he would have to suffer at the hands of advanced yogis, sadhus, and mahatmas. Naval had recommended to Munshi to purchase a second-hand D. Dion automobile for rupees 100, but repairing it costs rupees 300 more. On the afternoon of 5th October, Baba, Bairamji, Gustadji, and Munshiji <clears throat> rode into Malabar Hill for a test drive. When they returned, Baba remarked, the engine is so noisy that while talking, one has to shut to be heard. Just one moment. <clears throat> it stalled twice and Munshiji had to shout to the driver over the roar of the engine. When Naval came to the manzil, Baba told him facetiously, facetiously. Yeah, can you say that again, Rosalie? Facetiously. What do you mean by that? F in a funny way. Okay, thank and you. And humorously. You were right. The car was a steel. You really <laughs> are a miracle worker. <laughs> Would you believe that we drove the car all the way up to Malabar Hill at a terrific speed without having to blow the horn once? It's a fact. The noise of the engine was so loud that it was sufficient to make all pedestrians give way. <clears throat> and then make them strain their necks to see who would be fool enough to ride in such a car. During October, Baba sent Sadashiv Patil to Sakori to present Upasni Maharaj with some newly printed photographs of Maharaj and Sai Baba. Baba and Sadashiv informed Upasni that his biography was soon to be printed in Urdu, Marathi, and Gujarati. Baba requested that Upasni should <clears throat> raise the necessary money to pay for the printing expenses and that Maharaj would receive all the proceeds for the, from the sale of the books. Upasni frowned, sorry, frowned at this arrangement and sent the message with Sadashe. Mirwan, not I should meet all the expenses of printing and distributing the books. 
after the book is printed, he should arrange to pay me in advance half the amount of the profit he will earn on the sale of the books. The other half he may keep. To give up 50% of the expected profit, as I will be doing, is not a small gesture. <clears throat> H could not understand the spiritual charge of a perfect master and how it affects the world and the inner work between masters. This exchange about Maharaj's biography was a divine joke between two masters. Without hesitation, Baba went ahead with plans <coughs> to publish the Urdu version of Upasni Maharaj's biography. While he was in Ajmer, Baba had sent back Ramjo and a few of the other Mandali to their respective homes. One morning at Lonavla train station, Ramju encountered his friend Usman Saheb, the man who had first brought him into Baba's contact during the picnic trip to Mandwa. Although Ramju greeted Usman cordially, Usman taunted him with a couplet from Saadi's Gulistan in pointed reference to Meher Baba. Verily, it is worse than the tortures to hell to walk into heaven with the feet of another. Between 1918 and 1921, Usman often visited Mehranji at Kaspa Peth toddy shop. However, during 1922, before Baba left Pune for Bombay, Usman had changed his mind about him and had once again became, become emished in entrapments of the world. Rosalie, what is the meaning of emished? It's kind of uh, involved in deeply involved in. Thank you, Marvin. Usman was erroneously convinced it did not behove a Muslim to accept an Irani as his guru. Okay. When Ramju returned to Manzile Neem, he formed, he informed Baba of his meeting with Usman Saheb. After lunch, Ghani read out the couplet Usman had cited and Baba remarked, whatever Usman Sahib told Ramju is the 100% true. Heaven should be earned by our own extension, exertions. It should never be gained by favor or by the help of someone else. It should be deserved. Yet even heaven is in the realm of Maya and even by entering it, the bondage to illusion does not stop. But to enter heaven without deserving it, merely through favor or someone else's help, is no doubt not equal, to, but worse than burning in the fires of hell. In heaven, there are beautiful experiences, and in hell, terrible ones. However, in both situations, there is sanskaric binding. In heaven, there are shackles made of gold. and hell, there are rusty iron chains. Both types bind. It is quite useless to count on anyone's help to replace one type of fetters with another. What is fetters, Marvel? <clears throat> Should we look it up? Yeah, let me... I got an idea, but I better look it up. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, honey bunny. <laughs> a definition, a chain or <clears throat> or manacle used to restrain a prisoner, typically placed around the ankles, 
So it's a it's a uh, it's a binding. Thank you. So if Osman's interpretation is as I have explained, his statement is quite correct. If, however, his intention was to ridicule me or taunt you for following me, then is the has failed miserably. Read that again because I think you were fading in and out a little bit internet wise. Marvin, can you move to the next page? So, if Usman's interpretation is as I have explained, his statement is quite correct. If, however, his intention was to ridicule me or taunt you for following me, then his effort has failed miserably. I read that, yeah. You got to, yeah. You want me to go ahead, another page? Yeah, I could read or some, if someone else wants to read, whatever no. works. Oh, oh, no, Does anyone else want to read? You're in. Can I read? read? Can I read? Yeah. Let's have Me Meher read. Your internet's a little in and out oh, there. Okay. Jai Baba. As my disciples, you have nothing to do with either heaven or hell. You have to treat the spiritual path going beyond both heaven and hell to experience infinite bliss. I have held, um, I have held uh, out to expectations of something much higher than this dream, uh, dream of heavenly paradise and hellish uh, damnations. I have given you the hope that you will get experience of truth by staying with me that to experience uh, paramatta, uh, Paramatma, God of the infinite consciousness to the fathom, the secret of creation to gain this knowledge. Without the help of a God realized master is impossible. Without guidance of a perfect master, individual efforts of no evil, Hafiz has said. Without a guide, do not try to enter the path of love. I have failed hundreds of times by doing so. Molana Rumi, whose Masnavi Usman is fond of sitting, corroborate, how, I don't know how to spell it. Corroborates. 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 Uh, Hafiz. Hand not. Uh, uh, Corbett's Hafiz, then had not M M Maluna Rumi been the slave of Shames E. Tab Tabriz, he would never have become a perfect master. One who. Let me just of, read the footnote there uh, that we passed. Um, uh, this one? Um, I'm M Maluna? The, the Maluna? Footnote about, uh, about Hafiz. Yeah, where Hafiz was. It yeah. says Rum, Rumi's Masnavi, spiritual couplets. There's no, other, there's no words there. There's just a blue square, this thing. Uh, this yeah, thing I, open up, I open up the blue square and I read the footnote now. Okay. Rumi's Masnavi, spiritual couplets, is a six-volume poem regarded by many Sufis as second in importance only to the Quran and is often called the quran e parsi the Persian Quran. It is considered by many to be one of the greatest works of mystical poetry. Had not Maluna Rumi, uh, should I continue? Yeah. Okay. Uh, had not Maluna Rumi been the slave of uh, uh, Shams e Tabriz, he would never have become a perfect master. What it's Maulana. Maulana. Maulana, okay. He would never have become a perfect master. One whose object is the attainment of God, whose sole aim in the life is to find uh, God. What does he care for heaven and hell? In this connection, Hafiz has said, 
since I see my friend throughout both the worlds, heaven, hell, and the hours don't worry me. Poor Usman uh, Sahib does not understand what talks about to say that only Rasul e Khuda, Muhammad can point out to the path of take all Muslims to heaven is a beggary. That beggar's uh, description, his case is so helpless that instead of being in search of the truth, he leaves even the question of heaven for himself entirely in the hands of God and also asserts that by our own efforts, we should earn entry into heaven, else it is hell. It is sheer hypocrisy to preach to others that which you yourself do not practice. During uh, October 1922, a Parsi named Barjo Hidri boy engineer came to the master's contact. Baba once asked him to tell him uh, the mandali about the state of affairs. He did so often quoting from different religious sources and sometimes weeping during the narration. Some years ago, I was working as an engineer and earned a large salary. Somehow, I tumbled into a spiritual line and became gifted with great efforts. I managed to reach a stage where I could easily foretell events at times, get prayers fulfilled simply by asking. By asking. In fact, my prayers and my appeals could provoke a uh, a perspectival response from the unknown. This went on for a long time until I began to misuse my uh, supertendral achievements by speculating in cotton uh, futures in other gambling endeavors. At first, this gambling became extremely lucrative, and I did not find it necessary to continue working as an engineer. So I left it and paid more and more att attention to this new business. To my utter horror, he started bitterly sobbing. I soon found that the divine gift had vanished. Now, despite my best efforts, I am unable to regain that state I cry day and night in vain, but there is no response from him, leaving aside the mercenary uh, benefit I derived, which I no longer care about and will never indulge in gain. I really cannot describe the intense joy and bliss I felt while in intimate uh, communication with him. Although I have lost the treasure of foreknowledge, I can still feel and perceive things unseen and unfelt by ordinary human beings. Hence, I need no introduction of explanation about Mer Baba, in whom I find the greatest manifestation of divinity. I firmly believe that Mer Baba can restore my lost treasure to me in twinkling of an eye. If he so wishes, he is very great indeed. Baba was highly pleased at Barjo's uh, Frankston uh, and enjoying hearing this story. Meanwhile, can somebody read now? Anybody would you like to read? I can read. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mao. Thank you, man. Welcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Meanwhile, an uneducated 
lower caste man from Ahmad Nagar named Kashinot was living in Bombay and working as a dobi laundryman. The Mandali had been sending all their clothes as well as babas to him. But each time the laundry was returned, a few items were missing or someone else's clothes had been exchanged for theirs. Kashinat was warned about this several times, but it continued. On the 6th of October, he made the same mistake again. And uh, Baba sternly revoked him, then dismissed his service. But Kashinat pleaded for forgiveness. Baba agreed to re-employ him on the condition that Kashinat stay in the manzil and agree to wash only his hand, uh, agree to, to wash, all, uh, I'm sorry, agree to wash only his and the Mandeli's clothes there and not bring in any outsider's clothes to wash. Kashinat accepted for a 50 rupee per month as his wages and joined those staying in Manzalamim. That afternoon, Baba called Ghani to message to massage his legs. And as he was doing it, Baba uttered, May God help you. Ghani burst out laughing, and when Baba asked him the reason, he replied, We generally find it very difficult to follow the drift of your utterances. Your words seem to have a deeper meaning than that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, denoted on the surface. Only yesterday, you remarked that I looked healthy and particularly said that my neck had grown quite fat and strong. Now look, today my neck is very stiff and is causing me a lot of pain. Hearing this, Baba laughed. Bonnie asked, didn't you tell me that the worldly knowledge, education, and cleverness of a person before realizing God remains the same after realization? Baba clarified the point. What I had told you is quite correct. There are two kinds of knowledge. One, the worldly knowledge or the knowledge relating to the material world. And two, the divine knowledge, which is acquired after becoming one with God. A person having become one with God when dealing with matters relating to this material world, his actions and words thereafter reflect the divinity in him. Hence, the utterances and actions of such a person are invested with a sort of secrecy and grandeur about them. But this is usually lost sight of, but this is usually lost sight of by worldly people. For example, a ruby in the hands of a rustic will not be really appreciated by him but the same piece of stone will be treasured in the hands of a jeweler who knows its worth. The person who has become one with God is able to make the best use of his worldly knowledge on the strength of his divine knowledge, which, however, is not drawn upon in the least. Hence, the difference between the utterances and actions of the holy human being and the perfected person, uh, personalities is vast.
بابا از فانی تو برینگ الیدل کوکونات اویل and he began rub Gani's neck uh, promising hereafter you will never suffer from a stiff neck in the evening some of the other mandali asked Baba whether the nature of a person changes after the divine experience of realization a long discussion, discussion in use, in, ensued and in the end the master clarified the matter in relation to the personality of Hafez. Even after realization, a man's nature is the same but in a different way. In the normal human state, his anger, his curses, his strong language and, and his mannerisms express themselves because of his ego. Where there is ego, there is not God. And where there is God, there is no ego. For this reason, the words and deeds of a perfect one are egoless. Watch for all your egos, guys. <laughs> We're useless, as uh, Bauchi used to say. Bauchi used to say, you're useless. <laughs> but his special nature and personality remain the same even after realization and when expressed due to some mood there, there are they are of the greatest benefit to others this is the meaning of Hafez's couplet at one time, I craved to see various things, but since I saw you, I no longer desire to see anything else. This means that the nature to see is still there. Before, Hafiz craved to see a variety of different subjects. After the divine sight, he longed only to see God. It means the desire of seeing remains the same, but undergoes a change after becoming egoless. Suppose a man is in the habit of getting angry and beating other people. His nature will remain the same even if he turns into a saint, but the change is beyond imagination. Behind his anger, there is now no self-interest. It is simply an impulse with divinity behind it. It comes from the divine flow. And anyone who comes in contact with it is greatly benefited. After this explanation, Baba relaxed by playing chords with Munshiji for about an hour. During the game, he suddenly became very displeased with the Hindu mandali and began abusing them. He scolded Sadashiv and Arjun in, uh, in particular because they had not finished the vegetable dish which was served at lunch by Chathari, the cook, as directed by Baba. In his um, Ill-tempered mood, Baba uttered these words to Arjun, your family will perish by plaque. Arjun was trimble, trembling in shock. That's hey. plague, plague. Right. Oh, plague, I'm sorry. Your family will perish with plague. Arjun was trembling in shock. I'm sorry, Marvin, didn't we read this uh, before? We read it last week, right? Or well, the, the, it's are, very possible because I know we didn't start at the right place last week, but we, Mahu, we, we may have Let's come. discuss this at the end. Go Hold ahead. on one second. Yes, Marvin, finish up. Yeah, I was going to say it's very possible we read some of this last week. We just hadn't started at the right place. So I went back to where we should have started. Oh, okay. And, and, Got it. Yeah, so let's, all right. So let's, let's go on, I think. Sure, sure, of course. No, I was just wondering. 
The next day, 7 October 1922, through the master's words, a telegram was received from Puna that Arjun's nephew had died from the plague. Two years earlier, when playing Gili Danda in the, in the Bombarda locality, in Bombarda locality of Puna, Baba had foretold that an epidemic of the plague would break out. Most of the Kaspopeth Mandali were present when Baba uh, prophesied. The plague will begin from Bamburda and spreading towards Kaspopeth, will gradually engulf the entire city. Go ahead. Uh, the Bamberda area of Pune is now called Shibajinagar. Shibajinagar? Shibajinagar. Okay. Arjun sadly admitted that Baba had privately hinted of this calamity to him a few days before, but that knowledge did little to relieve his, pre his present anguish. Some time ago, his wife had died, and now his nephew was dead. Arjun had not expressed much sorrow at his wife's demise, and according to the master's instructions, did not inquire whether he should return home for her funeral. But his nephew's death affected him very much and he beseeched Baba to allow him to return to Pune for two days. All right, Mahu, thank you. Thank uh, you. Eugene, would you like to read? The master consented. Afterwards, Baba called the Hindu Mandali and told them, one member from each of your families will die from the plague currently ravaging Pune. Whosoever wishes to go home may leave immediately. And after today, whatever the circumstances, none of you should think of going home. Except for Arjun, who insisted on returning, all agreed to remain in Bombay. After this matter with the Hindu Mandali was settled, Baba confronted Gustaji about his eating habits. Why aren't you eating the quantity of food I tell you? Why do you continue to disobey me? For God's sake, eat your food as soon as you feel hungry, irrespective of the time. Don't complain afterward that I did not tell you. Gustaji replied, that is precisely what I am what I am doing. I create hunger by aimlessly moving about here and there in the building. The one cupful of cow's ghee you told me to have at 10 o'clock kills my appetite. I do not like to eat custard or pudding at any odd time. Baba scolded him. Don't go on repeating the same thing again and again. This is what upsets me. You should concern yourself with doing what I tell you. But whenever I tell you anything, you do not pay attention to it. And because of this, you make mistakes. Gustaji was irritated. You know full well that I am doing my best to please you. At times I eat less, at times more, depending on the vagaries of my stomach. I can't understand why you force me to eat more when I have no desire to do so. If I get ill, who will manage the petty and trifling affairs here, as I do from morning to night? Baba became more annoyed by his reply. These words clearly show that your understanding is very limited. Limited. If I tell you to do a certain thing and am ignorant 
of its implications and consequences, then I am not a sadguru, and no earthly good can come out of your uh, out of your staying with me. Gustaji replied, I have come to you according to Maharaja's instruction to follow your orders and listen to you in each and everything. That is why I am staying with you. Baba did not like this reply either and upbraided him. That is exactly what you are not doing while remaining with me. On the contrary, you want me to act according to your wish. From now on, I won't tell you anything. You draw up a program, give it to me, and I will follow it. Gustaji replied, if the situation were really like this, I would not have come to you, but on the contrary, I would have taken you to my house. If your desire is to test me, I do not see the necessity of it, since I have already suffered enough at the hands of Sai Baba and Upazani Maharaj. You are welcome to try the novices in this path. In spite of my finding no necessity for being tested, I do things and work with others just to keep them company and help them. Now, when things appear to be going smoothly, every two or three days, you bring up something that causes mutual annoyance and creates an argument between us. Such incidents dampen my spirit and dishearten me. Baba consoled him. Having such a close connection with me, actually being my dark side, does it behoove you to suggest that my orders and actions are at random and meaningless? I have not gathered the whole of the mandali and kept them with me to try them, to try them or you. Even after my experience, Maharaj made me sit in filth. Where was the necessity in that? Should I consider it as a trial in my case? I do not intend to test you or anyone. I only ask you to do exactly what I tell you. In, sowing, in so doing, you will help me in my work. I am always ready to obey your orders, Gustaji replied earnestly. And with a clear conscience, I can say that I have been doing so all along. Baba concluded, do not try to grasp my actions. You will never fathom. Even if I hand you a cup of poison, drink it without the least hesitation. By so doing, you will greatly ease the burden of my work. At this point, Gustaji quieted, but inwardly felt distressed. Baba had referred to him as his dark side, which he had once explain to the Mandali. Gustaji, unlike the rest of you, is fully prepared for realization. The only thing needed is to tear open the veil. But Gustaji felt that by being the dark side, the master was making him grope more and more in darkness before enlightening him. After this confrontation, Baba went to Ghani's room and asked him what he thought about what had happened. Ghani replied, 
However long a man may be laboring on this path, he is after all human without the experience of God. And being human, there is a limit to his patience and forbearance. Gustaji has at last spoken his mind and opened his heart today. Baba replied, no doubt Gustaji conscientiously tries his best to help me, but in his own way, and therein is his mistake. Everyone knows that he is the one who looks after my person, my individual needs, and sees to my comfort from morning to night. But all must obey me implicitly in every situation. Since the 2nd of October, the early morning repetition of the name of God had begun, and it was done daily throughout this period. While the Mandali sitting in their chosen places and postures were mentally repeating Yazdan or Allah or Ram, Baba was alone upstairs in his room, dashing his head on the floor. Sometimes while he was talking with the men, he would suddenly roll his eyes up in his head as if looking through his third eye and take a few deep breaths, then look down and dash his head on a window or a door. Once he shattered the glass in the window while doing this. Occasionally, the men would see bruises and blood on his forehead. Usually he would cover the wound by wrapping a large kerchief around his head. In one way or another, through physical illness or by hammering his head, Baba suffered continuously at the Monzil. Although he was intensely vigilant and lightning quick in his activities, he saw to the physical and mental well being of each man and would take notice of the smallest matters. Despite his extraordinary suffering, he continued to participate in games and sports and usually appeared to be the healthiest and most vigorous of any of the men at the Monzil. With Baba's permission, Bajifdar rented a bungalow in the suburb of Juhu for a picnic on Sunday, 8 October. But that morning, Baba's health was shaky and he appeared unwell. Despite this, he insisted on accompanying the Mandali. He remarked, we should go to Juhu with the joy that schoolboys feel while going home for vacation. Reaching Juhu, the master rested for a while and then played a field game called Thasak. Thasak, with the Mandali under the shade of coconut trees. Afterward, at lunch, he insisted on serving the rich meal of cookies, small, round, deep fried wheat bread, a potato dish and Shrikhand, a sweet yogurt dish. After eating, all were told to stay inside the mandala, inside the bungalow, as it was very hot outside. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, Rainy, are you available for reading? Uh, still attending to the girl, sorry. Okay. Pia, would you like to read? He had message. I'm going to pick it up from here. Okay. Around two o'clock, Baba sent Ghani to find out what the other men were doing. 
He found them scattered throughout the bungalow, talking, relaxing, and singing. Only Vital was asleep, snoring loudly. Baba called Vital and ordered him to immediately leave for Pune. Baba then asked Ghani to name those who were reclining on the sofas. He reported the culprits to be Rustam and Sadashiv. Baba immediately called the men and rebuked rebuke them at length. In spite of my wretched condition, I have brought you all to this place to give you a refreshing change. It is for you that I am undergoing all this suffering. But while I suffer, you enjoy. What difference would it have made to me whether I had stayed on in the manzil? Hence, it grieves me to find that you have no consideration for my sufferings. Here I am lying on the ground, undergoing excruciating pain in the stomach, having had four bowel movements since morning, while you are comfortably sprawling on sofas and chairs. I know you come from well-to-do families and are accustomed to all kinds of luxuries and conveniences and are used to lounging on comfortable furniture. But now that you have discarded, on my asking, all comforts for the time being, you should have your mind under control and at once remember the line you have adopted and the spiritual goal you have fixed as your ideal. At this juncture, you should consider yourselves in jail. Forget about everything else. Don't let your minds wander to those things which you have given up. Even if an occasion arises and a chance is offered to you, don't get enmeshed in things of Maya again. You have, however, not to pass through the dreadful sufferings or undergo the hardships entailed in this path when you when with me. You are simply required to go against your own will and wish. You have not to do certain things which you have been doing up till now and to do certain things you have no liking for. For example, I'm feeling hungry, you used to eat. And now you are used to, are asked to eat when you have no liking to take food and not to touch it when you have a craving appetite for it. You used to take a nap in the daytime and now you are forbidden to do so. Similarly, you have never done physical labor, but while here at times you are asked to work in the blazing sun. These are instances of your going against your own mind. And in this way, you will gradually learn to control it. Look at the famous Indian leaders like Gandhi and the Ali brothers. Sidebar says, Shokat Ali and his brothers and his brother were Indian freedom fighters who like Mahatma Gandhi championed Hindu Muslim unity. Out of a sense of patriotism and for the sake of the nation, they have left all comforts of life, undergoing imprisonment for long periods of time. For the sake of the country and the welfare of the world, which is all a mere dream, these leaders are suffering so much. So imagine how much more you should do for God, the very source of all that is. This term of so-called imprisonment with me is only for 10 months wherein you are required to go against the dictates of your mind. It is the least you can do to reach the highest. Hafez has said it well, quote, you must leave the abode of your nature, temperament, and thoughts. Unless you do so, you cannot reach the lane of truth. People have left the world and passed through agony in search of God. But here you should thank your lucky stars that you are to realize him so very easily, in spite of living in the world, by staying with me, people think you have renounced it. This whole universe with all its vastness, grandeur and beauty is nothing but sheer imagination. In spite of so many discoveries, researches and scientific knowledge, the creation remains a great unsolved riddle. With all the latest inventions, like electricity and harnessing steam, humanity at large is quite helpless against nature and its so-called freaks. The greatest warriors, scientists, doctors, and astrologers, without exception, have to bow to nature's common law, death. In the world, everyone is helpless, ignorant, and out for himself. 
The bondage and ties of worldly relationships is only a pretense. Swami Vivekananda aptly compares this with the truth when he says, they know no truth who dream such empty vacant dreams as father, mother, child, wife, and friend. God is for all and for all that the avatar or sadguru and for that the avatar or sadguru manifests. Barring these persons, there is no one in the world who possesses real love. Just see how anxious Maharaj is for me, always sending messages, inviting me to go to Sikori so that he can share in my terrible spiritual sufferings. The subject of discussion then turned to religions and Baba continued, the light of Zoroaster has been extinguished by his followers themselves. His was the highest form of Sufism. If Zoroaster were born again in this material world, he would find it difficult to recognize his own religious tenets as practiced by the present day followers of his creed. The same is true of all religions. The Muslim mullahs, Hindu pundits, Zoroastrian dasturs, and Christian priests have mutilated the original religion for their own selfish ends. <clears throat> the discussion continued for an hour and instances were cited of how the priest class in almost every ism had turned religion into a business profiting from various ceremonies and rituals. About 3.30 p.m. all were ordered to go outside for a game of Gila Danda. Baba participated initially, but soon returned to the bungalow after instructing all to continue playing. After an hour, he called the mandali inside. He was vomiting the food he had taken five hours before. It was undigested, and Ghani remarked that it was astonishing from a medical standpoint for their food to remain undigested for over five hours in the stomach. Baba and the group were to leave Juhu that afternoon, but he indicated he was feeling too weak to walk back to the train station. The master therefore decided to leave by taxi with Gustaji, Jalbai, Ruslam, and Sarosh, while the others returned to the Manzil by the local train. During the day, Baba had had 12 motions, and in the night he had six or seven more. However, the next day he looked quite healthy and cheerful. Thus, the, quote, fourth death that he had spoken of was suffered and passed through. In their ardor to gain the divine experience, the men would all eagerly rise by 4 a.m. to meditate and repeat the name of God. But when a number of days passed without anyone having even a glimpse of divinity, they became disheartened and lost hope in gaining anything spiritual from their morning practice. Baba had hinted that by the end of September, the Mandali would have the experience, quote unquote. But by October, they realized that none of them properly understood the master's statement. Waking up so early now became difficult for them. At first, Baramji's calls would make them rise quickly from their beds. But later he had to enter each room to shake the men awake one by one. During these calls, Baramji himself was practically sleepwalking colliding with doors, and once even falling down the stairs. <laughs> Rosalie, would you like to pick up? You're muted. Half asleep, all would gather near the bathrooms and continue to doze while standing as there were only two washrooms for 30 men. At this time, Baba stressed renewed attention toward cleanliness in the manzo, the men's bedrooms, and especially the kitchens, bathrooms, toilets, and dining room were ordered to be kept immaculate. Baba also became more fastidious toward his own personal cleanliness. He would lather with soap very liberally during his daily bath and stress the necessity of keeping his clothes, sheets, and pillows spotlessly clean. 
He separated his own kitchen from the Mondelez and Gustaji would cook for him. Since moving into Manzilimim, the men would sit on the floor, irrespective of whether it was damp or cold. But during October, the master ordered all to sit on a mat. To remove drinking water from the earthen pots, earthenware pots, a metal ladle was kept hanging nearby. No one was permitted to dip their glass directly into the pot to extract water. A rule was also made against going to the toilet with one's sandals on. Special wooden sandals were kept near the toilets for that purpose. A stricter attitude towards sanitation took place in the everyday routine relating to living, drinking and eating in the manzil, and observing cleanliness in every matter assumed the highest importance. As a further step toward cleanliness, each of the men was asked to kill 50 mosquitoes daily to avoid contracting malaria. This gave rise to amusing scenes in the house. Each man would lunge to every corner and wall of the manzo trying to kill his daily quota by swatting the flying pest any way he could. By the end of the day, their hands had become so stained with the blood of mosquitoes, they joked that they looked like butchers returning home after a hard day's work in a slaughterhouse. On the afternoon of 10 October, 1922, Baba asked Ghani to remind him about the matter of killing mosquitoes when he was having his dinner. In the evening, when Ghani was about to remind him according to his instruction, Baba forbade him to utter a single word until he had finished his meal. Thereafter, Baba scolded Ghani you have failed in following my order because you did not remind me at seven o'clock about the mosquitoes. Ghani replied, I had not forgotten, but before I could say a word, you ordered me not to talk until you had finished eating. Baba replied, it is true that you had to keep quiet because of this second order, but you still could have reminded me through gestures. When some others conceded that he could have tried, Ghani acknowledged his mistake, although it was unintentional. Thumps and bumps was another game that was occasionally played in the manzo. All would sit with their backs to the wall, keeping an open space in the middle. They would try to strike one another with a tennis ball, particularly aiming at the head. The one who caught the ball had the right to strike someone else, including Baba. They were free to throw the ball as hard as they could, but not with the feeling of malice or anger. Baba and Ghani were the best throwers. Baba would look to one side and throw the ball in the other direction. Ghani's arm was usually accurate, but Baramji was the worst player of all. He would never catch the ball and went on receiving hit after hit on the head. This game was played vigorously with a lot of ruckus and good-natured shouting. It refreshed the minds and spirits of all the men. While playing, their concentration would be entirely focused on the game and they would completely forget about their cares. For the master, such an activity was a medium of his work. Baba was always doing his inner spiritual work whether by playing games, cards, conversing, discoursing, watching movies, or cricket matches, 
rebuking someone, getting angry, or creating quarrels among the Mandali. Through every action, he did his universal work by utilizing any and every means for it. During the afternoon of 11 October, Baba told Adi and Gani to put the sit sitar in its case. This was a peculiar order as for the past four months, the sitar had not been kept in its cover even when unused for days. Accordingly, when Adi opened the case, he smelled an awful stench and found a dead rat inside. <laughs> then he understood why Baba had asked him, asked them to cover the instrument. When Baba was told about it, he asked Ramju to clean the case with phenol a disinfectant. While Ramju was doing this, Baba lent a hand washing it. Baba emphasized that infection would spread in the manzil unless proper measures to ensure cleanliness were followed. Later, he told Bani to write the following on the notice board. Most urgent, a dead rat was found in the case when the sitar was ordered to be put in it. This shows that a serious disease like the plague is likely to invade the premises unless the rooms are kept scrupulously clean as already ordered. Marijuana. 11th October 1922. But shortly afterward, the above notice was wiped out by the master before all could read it, probably to avoid frightening anyone. And the following was substituted. Tincture of iodine should be applied on eczema, boils, pimples, and any other skin trouble. Marwan. That evening, Ghani, Adi, and Ramju were sitting on the front steps of the manzil, complaining of the hard life they were leading. Ghani vented, Baba is steadily increasing our difficulties. Afternoon tea has been stopped, sleeping hours have been curtailed, and he insists on our stuffing food into our stomachs, despite our disinclination to eat. We no longer get fresh bread at breakfast. We have to kill at least 50 wretched mosquitoes daily. And each day, new orders and instructions issue forth. He is always on us about something. We cannot breathe freely for even a moment. Ramju agreed that he was right and that their difficulties seemed to be increasing. Ghani added, I feel Baba's grip is tightening and growing stronger day by day. But hardly had he begun to finish the sentence when Adi was suddenly called by Baba. After some time, Ramju and Ghani were also called. Baba scolded Ghani. You don't do any work around here and, on the contrary, instigate others to become lazy. He then scolded Ramju and Adi and ordered them not to talk among themselves for the next 10 months. Before sending them away, he asked them, do you feel hurt about this? Ramju and Adi replied that they did. But Ghani said, I did not feel a thing. On the contrary, I began thinking I might make some mistake in carrying out this new order. Baba did not appreciate hearing his comment and withdrew the order concerning Adi and Ramju, but ordered Ghani not to talk with anyone in the manzil for the next 10 months. 
He then directed Ramju to write the following on the notice board, sent to Coventry. Footnote there says, sent to Coventry is a British expression for being shunned. Uh, everyone in the Manzil is strictly prohibited from talking or holding any sort of communication by signs or through writing or in any other way with Ghani. All right, Rosalie, thank you. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, Eugene, you wanna finish this up here? During their evening supper, Baba again emphasized that no one in the Monzo should have any connection with Ghani and to ignore him. He even went as far as to say that they were to treat him as if he were part of the furniture. For some days, Baba stopped talking with or seeing Ghani altogether and then sent Gustaji to ask him, now do you feel sorry in any way? Ghani reiterated, I do not feel anything. Baba became all the more displeased, berating him. If I am anything, I will make you tell the truth. He then added to what was already written on the board. If Ghani has any shame left in him, he should immediately leave the Monzil. Merwan, during this period, some families of the married Mondali were being financially supported by Baba. Later that same night of 11 October, Baba asked those Mondali members concerned whether they had received money order, money order acknowledgements from their families. Some replied no. The acknowledgement receipts had been kept with Ghani who went to his room and upon returning, handed one receipt to Ahmed Khan Gabai and one to Khandi Ram. Seeing this exchange, Baba became so perturbed with ah Ahmed and Khandi Ram for having anything to do with Ghani that he demanded that the three men leave the Manzil immediately. Khandi Ram and Ahmed were frightened and began perspiring while Ghani was resigned. After a while, Baba called them back and forgave them, slowly reverting once more to his good humored self. Then he quietly addressed Ghani, I order you to return to Pune and stay there. I am not sending you away permanently. You can keep your baggage in your room you also can come here one day a month and stay with me. Your connection with me will remain intact and be secure. I will definitely do for you what I have to do. Ghani pleaded, I am bound to follow your order, but I don't relish the prospect of remaining in Puna and spending only one day a month with I don't know how I shall pass my time there. Baba then inquired, does this mean that you felt something with this last order? Ghani admitted he did. And Baba then told him to write on the notice board, by Ghani's acknowledging that he is distressed from the beginning, he is forgiven. Merwan. Mm -hmm. Wow. My God.